Greetings and welcome back into 303, and we continue now with our lecture on Paradise Lost Book 1. When we left off, we were at, at roughly line uh, 391, 392, and we were uh, 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 pointing out that we've got this now right in the center of Book 1 of Paradise Lost. We've got this cataloging of the nasty demons, the fallen angels who fell out of heaven with Satan. And Milton, some, some see this as kind of showing off. I mean, he's going to obviously show us his prodigious learning. In earlier lectures, we talked about Milton's unbelievable education. And he's going to show us just how educated he is, as he now will reference different kinds of nasty deities, is a way to say about it. For example, he begins with Moloch. And at line 391, I mean, I'll just read the opening lines of this cataloging that's going to go on for a number of lines here. First, Moloch, horrid king. The number of times horrid gets used, of course, in the opening book of Paradise Lost is amazing, as we pointed out. Horrid king, be smirched with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears, though for the noise of drums and trembles loud their children's cries unheard that pass through fire to his grim idol. Whoa! So our first evil bad guy, villain, demon is Moloch, who we're told from, uh, you know, uh, ancient, from ancient times. By the way, if you're interested, you can read about this in 1 Kings 11.7. Um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 2 Kings 23. I apologize. 2 Kings 23. This is some nasty business if you want to take a look at it in the uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, Moloch is often associated with child sacrifice and he played drums so that he could, and, and, and cymbals, so that the sound of children screaming as they were being offered up through the fire uh, would not be heard. Uh, nasty business. From here we go to, uh, from uh, uh, Moloch we go to Shemos at line 406. And I'm just going to work now through these very quickly um, as you are kind of getting ready for possible exams or testing over this text. Um, it might make sense to know the, the major bad demons. God says, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, Chemos is a uh, Moabite deity. Solomon did build a shrine according to uh, uh, 1 Kings 11.7 and Numbers 21.29 um, to this uh, deity. From there at line 422, we go to Balaam. The abbreviation, of course, is Baal here. Some will argue this is the golden calf of Exodus 32, 1 through 20 in that story, although we may... We may see that closer, closer aligned to the Egyptian god that will be mentioned here later. And as well at line 438, we've got Ashtoreth, the Middle Eastern goddess of fertility and war, will be mentioned. Then we go to Dagon, the Philistine uh, sea god mentioned in 1 Samuel 5, 4, a um, dismembered god, for those of you that know that story out of the Bible. As well, when we later give lectures over Samson uh, Agonistes, uh, Milton's uh, final poem. Line 13, he'll mention this Dagon uh, uh, demon goddess, or god again. Um, from there at line 467, we, we meet uh, Rymon, sometimes called Hadid, the Semitic god of weather. Uh, and then from there at line 478, we meet um, Isis, uh, or Isis and Oris and Isis, the Egyptian gods. Um, and uh, um, at line 482, um, we, we'll read this. Uh, Nor did Israel escape the infection when their borrowed gold composed the, the calf in Oreb. We're going to get into this gold thing by the end of, of uh, uh, Paradise Lost Book 1. Uh, but here, of course, we're going to remember that famous story from Exodus. And the rebel king doubled that sin in that sin in Bethel and in Dan, likening his maker to the grazed ox. Of course, here again, we're, we're mentioning this, this uh, story, right, of, um, uh, of Exodus 32, 1 through 20. Um, likening his maker to the grazed ox. Jehovah, who in one night, when he passed from Egypt marching, equaled with one stroke both her firstborn and all her bleeding gods. Now, this is an interesting uh, bit of, uh, of the text, and we have to point out, and many scholars have pointed this out, that at line 391, we're told that Moloch is a terrible, terrible deity because he demands the killing of children. Of course, notice we just read that, of course, in the famous story of the Passover, 
God here re re listed as God, of course, in the Exodus story, it's the angel of the Lord, con uh, God, um, will kill all firstborns, which sounds a whole lot like child sacrifice as well. We're not the first to point this out, of course, right? Again, you have other kinds of stories, Judges chapter 11 and the story of Jephthah, of course, with a child sacrifice. And, of course, the penultimate argument sometimes is that if you'll think about it, if Jesus Christ is to be sacrificed and Jesus Christ is God's Son, we have a different kind of child sacrifice. Of course, we're going to point this out, that Christ in Paradise Lost will volunteer for the mission to save all of humankind. Finally, the last one at line 490 is uh, Belial. He, this is the Vulgate synonym for Satan from, the, from Jerome's Vulgate. And yet... Here, we got separate deities as devils, as, uh, as, as Milton will understand it. Um, this word, Bel, is Hebrew, the Hebrew word for worthless. So sons of Belel are uh, you know, good for nothings. They're worthless kinds of people. This Belel is interested in lewdness, love, sex. So here, uh, the, the, uh, the whole idea of, of having um, a god that's you know, only interested in the in in, in uh, the luxurious cities. To quote here, um, we'll just we'll just continue with this since I'm reading it for you, um, uh, starting at at lines uh, four uh, ninety or following. There, um, he says, Belial came last. Then whom a spirit more lewd fell not from heaven, or more gross to love vice for itself. To him no temple stood or altar smoked. Yet who more off than he in temples and at altars? When the priest turns atheist, it's an interesting line. When the priest turns atheist, as did Eli's sons who filled with lust and violence the house of God. In courts and palaces he also reigns. And in luxurious cities where the noise of riot ascends above their loftiest towers. And injury and outrage. And when night darkens the streets, then wander forth the sons of Belial. Flown with insolence and wine, witness the streets of Sodom that night in Jiva, when the hospitable door exposed a matron to avoid a to avoid a worse rape. Um, of course, these are stories that come from the Bible, especially the the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the offering up, of course, of Lot's uh, uh, young. Uh, virgin as opposed to uh, male raping that might go on. There's been much debate about this. Why is it worse to be raped by a man than to be raped by a woman or, or to rape a man as opposed to rape a woman? It seems that a patriarchal kind of view is instantiated here. All of this pointing out though the point that uh, Milton wants to make it clear that this God is interested in the most nasty licentious. Of course Milton the Puritan is going to have serious problems with all of that. Well, that takes us now to the last part of book number one of Paradise Lost. They're ready um, to go at lines uh, 459 and following, uh, I'm sorry, 559 and following. And now they're ready to begin to put together their plans. So let's read it starting at lines 559 and following. Thus they, the, the demons now, is all constructed and, and congregated. Breathing united force with fixed thought, moved on in silence to soft pipes that charmed their painful steps over the burnt soil. By the way, these soft pipes are going to come back in our study of Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn. Um, Keats, obviously, very influenced by Milton. And now, advanced in view, they stand a horrid front of dreadful length and dazzling arms and guise of warriors old with ordered spear and shield awaiting what command their mighty chief had to impose. He, through the armed files, darts his experienced eye and soon traverse the whole battalion views. It's as if a general is looking out over all of his soldiers, right, as they're standing there ready to do war against God. Note the irony of this. They just got thrown out of heaven because they could not, of course, withstand the, fight, the, the force of the Almighty God. And now they're ready to go back and do it all over again. There's a bit almost of like irony and, and almost like humor in all of this, right? Their order to their visages and stature as of gods. Notice the as of gods. They're not gods, but they're as of gods. In other words, Satan is going to try to convince them they actually have a chance to do something here. Right? Their number last he sums, and now his heart distends with pride and hardening in his strength. Glories. And then to continue on to, pay, on to line 587 and following, he above the rest in shape and gesture proudly eminent, 
stood like a tower. His form had not lost all her original brightness, nor appeared less than Archangel ruined, and the excessive glory obscured. And then an, another simile, epic simile, as when the sun new risen looks through the horizontal misty air shone of his beams, or from behind the moon in dim eclipse, disastrous twilight sheds. And here now we will get the millions of spirits for his fault, immersed or deprived of heaven, and from eternal splendorous flung for his revolt, yet faithful how they stood, their glory withered. And then he says, Milton says, and now prepare to speak, whereat their doubled ranks they bend from wing to wing and half enclose him round. And so now you've got the the next speech of, of Satan as he is ready now to begin to say it's time for war. Let's jump to uh, lines six, uh, six, um, uh, um, 660 and, and following as he says it in his, in, in, in his speech. Um, he says it this way, but these thoughts full counsel must mature. Peace is despair for who can think submission. War, he says, then war open or understood must be resolved. He spake, and to confirm his words, out flew millions of flaming swords drawn from the thighs of mighty cherubim. The sudden blaze far around illumined hell. I should point out numerology is interesting. Um, any number of scholars has pointed this out. I'm not making a new observation here. But any time that we're in one of these books, we always want to look at line 666. Six, six. That is to say, the line of Satan, the number of Satan. And here, at line 666 in, in the opening uh, part, we've got all of the cherubim uh, that are now fallen, pulling out their swords in unison, and it's unbelievably bright. In other words, Satan is now calling all of them to say, let's go to war. By the way, we should point out that almost every time, that war is mentioned in this poem. It's mentioned, of course, as other related to the demonic, right? Now, of course, we've had already the war that obviously landed all of these evil demons in, in hell, but notice that Satan is constantly talking about war. Let's go back to war. Let's go back to war. Let's do this, let's do this war thing, right? Okay. And in the final speech, we're ready. Now, the next part and the last part of the poem is, uh, of part one, is this strange pandemonium construction. Now let's put it in our notes and then we'll talk about it. Satan needs a palace because he's now in hell and it's, there's nothing there. And so the creation of pandemonium will be critical here. There, he's, we're told, stood a hill and Satan is going to point to this hill and to say that uh, uh, Mammon, the god, of course, of money. Mammon, who loved when he was walking in heaven. He never saw God's glory. He was always looking down at the beautiful gold and say, marveling at how beautiful the gold was. Mammon is ready to go to war, and we need to build pandemonium along with, uh, along with uh, Mulsaber, the architect. Mulsaber, by the way, is um, the... Uh, name of Vulcan or Hephaestus from our Greek mythology, right? Thrown out of heaven by Hera, uh, down into Hades, and then allowed to escape with the help of Dionysius. But these two together are now going to create pandemonium. Um, let's let's uh, finish now with some of those lines. Um, I'll be working with you here, um, starting at line 760, uh, 760, uh, 752 and, and following. Meanwhile, the winged heralds, by command of sovereign power, with awful ceremony and trumpet sound, throughout the fat, the host proclaim a solemn council forthwith to be held at pandemonium. Now, let's get that word in our notes. Uh, Milton creates this word, pan, meaning all demon, of course, that demonium, you can see. In other words, it's the place where all demons reside. But we're told that there's going to be hundreds and thousands and thousands of them coming as they get ready to tear open the earth at line 670. Now, um, this one, this is an interesting uh, set of lines, so I'm going to read them for you. By him first, we're told now, mammon, by him first, men also, and by suggestion, taught, ransacked the center, and with impious hands, rifled the bowels of their mother earth for treasures better hid. In other words, we're told now, soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound 
and digged out ribs of gold. Milton's language is the language of rape. That these demons rape Mother Earth and create this hole there where they drag out all of the gold. Now, we'll come back to this, but much has been made of this whole reading of this part of the poem where we're going to have uh, uh, demons destroying in some ways some notion of Earth to extract gold to create this pandemonium, this beautiful palace, right? And there, of course, the shrieking of the devils finally is heard at line 777. Let's go ahead and go there at the end. Behold a wonder, we're told, but not now who seemed in bigness to surpass earth's great giant sons, nor less than smallest dwarves in narrow room throng numberless like the pygmy race. In other words, let's say it this way for your nose. These huge demons are going to be shrunk down so that they can all fit into this pandemonium of that infernal court, we're told. But far within and in their own dimensions, like themselves, the great seraph lords and cherubim in close recess and secret conclave set a thousand demigods on golden seats, frequent and full. After short silence then, in summons read, the great consult begun. So we are at the end now of book one. So, what have we got to say about this now, the shrinking of the devils down, uh, all of them getting ready for their great consoles? Well, let's start at level 2A and finish now in our conversation. Themes, messages, several of these, right? First of all, let's just point out all of the different falls of Milton, right? Um, we've already pointed out that this is a poem that can be read at both the philosophic, psychological, as well as the sociological level. Think about it, the different falls that are already mentioned. Man's first disobedience, of course, is a fall. Satan's rebellion, which of course is pride, and remember what Proverbs 16, 18 says, or Proverbs 6, 18 says about uh, um, the pride goeth before the fall, right? Angels, of course, and the demons also fall. We have a political reading, of course, of this as well. New worlds are going to be addressed. And in fact, we'll have two different new worlds. We'll have the world of Eden, and we'll have the world of Pandemonium. Any number of uh, scholars uh, have read this poem and pointed out that it's possible Milton is wanting to make some contrast between two different new worlds that are about to be created. Of course, there's the new world of North America, which will be primarily, what, agrarian, right, and Dutch Protestants. And then there will be, of course, that new world of the conquistador of Central America and what is it that's understood there? Well, that was not, of course, colonized. That was what conquered and for what reason? Gold, money, right? And so the distinctions can be made there as well. We'll come back to those distinctions, by the way, as we get into our study. How about this for a, a major message or theme? The unconquerable will. Satan saying, I will not give up. I will continue to fight. Is this good? Is this heroic? Is this bad? Does it lead to disaster? Of course, the journey motif is already, uh, has already been mentioned here, and the fall from heaven is the beginning of this journey motif. Let's jump to level 2B really quickly, the epic form. Um, uh, let's go back to the very beginning of the poem's uh, opening lines, and I just want to just pick at random here, just the opening lines. Let's just work with lines 3 and lines 4 real quickly. Uh, blank verse, put it in your notes. We're talking about iambic pentameter unrhymed. But let's make sure we remember uh, iambic pentameter. For example, line three, line four. With loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Now, of course, we can read it that way, but if we slow this down, we will hear the iambic pentameter. Now, let's remember an iamb foot is ba bum. Not stress, stress. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Remember, an iambic foot, five times, iambic pentameter. Hear it, for example, as we go through this one. With loss of Eden till one greater man. With loss of Eden till one greater man. Restore us and regain the blissful seat. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Milton's poetry, and remember, he's blind when he constructs the 10,000 lines of this poem. He's already lost his sight after all those years of reading. And he will recite these lines of poetry out loud 
to his amanuensis daughters and others, but he will do it in iambic pentameter, all of the lines of this entire poem. Again, one more reason for us to marvel, yes? Of course, we have the epic invocation of the muse, which again, it, to be is going to fall right in line with what we're, what we're always going to see when we study epics. Help me to tell the story, basically, right? We have the epic battle, more of that to come, obviously. The epic similes, we've already mentioned so many of these um, in, our, in our study. Epic protagonist, think about what Aristotle said in his classic poetics. He said that great drama has a protagonist with whom the audience most identifies. We've given lectures on this elsewhere. And of course, the audience watches that protagonist go through a fall, the hamartia, the tragic flaws are part of that, and usually that's hubris or pride. Think about the ways in which Milton is playing that game, obviously, with the fall of Satan. And yet, notice Satan's pride. Is Satan the hero or the protagonist of our epic? Or is he rather the antagonist of our epic? There's been huge debate about this, and of course, after the poem was published, you can imagine any number of people were like, this is not a Christian poem, because Satan is where we begin, and Satan sure does sound awfully heroic as he begins the process of saying, no, 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 we're not done, we got work to do. Of course, as well, we have finally the epic catalogs, that's that listing of all of those major devils, list of demons and demigods and all of that, the nasties, right? Let's jump to level 2A. Uh, of course, relationships to, uh, I'm sorry, to 3A, uh, relationships to other texts and the like. Now, of course, you cannot read a poem like this without understanding the Bible. Let's point out that Milton assumes that you know the Bible, that you've read it. He assumes you know Christian theology, but we should point out that when he talks about Christian theology, he most always is not referencing Catholic Christian theology, we think of St. Augustine, but rather...